to a common problem that arises in a particular context. You'll learn more what that means later. If you Google for iterator pattern, you will find some articles that talk about this and uh, explain sort of different things about it. Uh, if you poke around a bit more, you might find some stuff that shows you pictures like this. There's a picture of the iterator pattern. That's the picture from more or less from the Gang of Four book. By the way, if you wonder who are the Gang of Four, Gang of Four. So this is our Gang of Four. This is the Gang of Four. It's four authors who wrote the book called Design Patterns. There are other Gang of Four as well. There's a punk band. <laughs> um, probably not the one we really want to care about here. Here we go. This is a much more interesting Gang of Four. This is the original Gang of Four. They were, um, let's see, how would I explain this? They were counter-reformists, including the late Mao Zedong's widow and, and three of her compatriots, who didn't like the changes that were taking place in the post-Mao China after Mao's death. And they wanted to go back to a more traditional Maoist communist perspective. And the people like Deng Xiaoping, who came later, wanted to be more reform-oriented. So these folks were, were not very happy with, with him. So you can read more about it. I won't go into detail. But that was the original Gang of Four. And they had a great show trial in the early 80s, as only places can do that like to have show trials. And uh, there actually is some significance to that, because if you take a look here, once again on the web, the web Gang of Four Show Trial Patterns, you will find the show trial of the Gang of Four. So this was the Gang of Four. And they were accused of crimes against computer science. <laughs> so it's um, actually quite funny. And uh, you should take a look at it. It's, if, if you have some time, Google it. It's, it's rather humorous. And very, very geeky, but very cool, like you know, historically rooted geekiness, which is pretty neat. OK, so what the, the iterator pattern does is it gives us a way to access every element in a collection or a container, or as the Gang of Four book calls it, an aggregate. Think container, without exposing how the underlying aggregate container, collection, whatever, is actually implemented. So you can say, start at the beginning and give me an element until you reach the end. That's what the iterator pattern is all about. And basically, it, abs it abstracts or encapsulates the details of how all that works. Not surprisingly, STL uses this pattern in spades, just like it uses many other patterns in spades as well, like factory patterns, adapter patterns, strategy patterns, and so on that we'll talk about later. STL iterators are a realization of the iterator pattern that has some, have some really cool properties. An STL iterator allows you to be able to treat built-in types, like pointers that point to arrays, built-in arrays, equivalently from the point of view of the algorithms that operate on them to iterators that point to user-defined types, like maps and sets and lists and decks and vectors and all those kinds of things. So it's really cool. So it basically gives you a pointer-like syntax that allows the algorithms to be independent of whether things are user-defined or built-in. And the way they're used in STL is we use them essentially to iterate over ranges of things. So usually, not always, but often it's from the beginning of a container to the end, or more specifically, one past the end. Although we never actually access the one past the end. We just iterate until we get to that point. And so you typically use pointer arithmetic to walk through these things. Iterators are really, really, really important in STL. They're the essence of what makes it what it is in some sense. The iterator pattern is at the heart of what makes STL so cool. And the reason for that is that it allows you to separate out the algorithms from the containers. So there are no algorithms that work directly on any one container, although there are methods that are specific to containers. But the STL algorithms, the so-called generic algorithms, only work on iterators and those iterators work on the containers, or get access to the elements of the containers. And this is a great example of a, of a very fundamental pattern you find all the time in software and computer science. One of the most fundamental patterns in software and computer science is that no problem is so complicated, it can't be solved given enough levels of indirection. Okay? So what we're doing here is we're indirecting away from a specific container, 
and we're accessing it through its iterators, which give you an indirection, and that allows the algorithms to be ind more, more independent of the underlying containers. Um, does anybody else know some other great examples of levels of indirection in computer science and how they save us various things? Yes, sir? Is recursion an example of a level of abstraction? Well, it's, it's abstracting away from the runtime call stack to some extent, although that uh, almost any form of abstraction, by the way, is a, a form of indirection. But it's not quite what I was looking for. But it's, it's along the right path. I mean, assembly code and C++ are abstractions of digital logic. Great, great example. So <clears throat> the classic examples are, um, a, you know, this is hard to believe in, in 2014, but back in the, the early days of computing, people would sit there and actually have to type in physical machine code addresses for everything. That's how they program. So assembly code, which we kind of think of as rather rudimentary and very low level today, was actually a big step forward because it added an additional level of indirection where you could have a symbol like move, which could actually be represented by physical addresses in various ways in various machines. So that was one form of abstraction. As you then point out going further, languages, programming abstractions, other APIs have added naming abstraction, function abstraction, data abstraction. Those are all extra levels of indirection. My favorite example of extra levels of indirection, however, is virtual memory. So virtual memory allows your computer to think it has a gigantic amount of physical memory, when in fact it may have a smaller, although today rather gigantic, amount of physical memory, but it has an even more gigantic amount of virtual memory. And so by having extra levels of indirection, you can write programs that think they have a big address space when they actually have a big address space, but they only have a smaller amount of space that actually has physical space. Yeah. Well, that's a more that's probably a good question for a philosophy class about what does it mean to be a human being and and how are we being replaced bit by bit or bite by bite by computers. Um, uh, all I'll say for the time being is that uh, uh, computers give us an opportunity to replace things that are probably best automated, giving us more time to do things that are not easily automated. That's the way I look at that. And I look at that in ed education as well. OK, so iterators are central. You use them in order to access the elements of, of containers. And um, that way you can write generic algorithms that don't know whether they're talking to a vector or a deck or a list or a map or a set, which is kind of cool. Here's the example that we took a look at uh, last class to kind of illustrate this. Now we're going to show how we can implement it using an iterator. So before, if we zip back here for a second, you can see how we did it initially. Here's the initial implementation we had. As you can see, we basically read the command line arguments and we pushed them to the end of a uh, vector, and then each time through, we, we printed out in the loop what each element was. What we're going to do now is something much more interesting, or marginally more interesting. First thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and put everything at the end of the vector. And notice how the vector starts out empty. So there's nothing in the vector to start with. And every time we do a pushback, it'll go ahead and first check to make sure there's enough space in there. And if there's not, it'll add additional space, kind of like your set method does in your assignment for assignment two. And then it'll go ahead and add it at the end. Now, once we put everything into the vector, the next thing we do is we go ahead and we tell the vector, please give me an iterator to the beginning of this vector. So it gives us back an iterator. And then while we haven't reached the end of the vector, then we're going to go ahead and print out each element one at a time. So there's a couple interesting things going on here. First of all, notice how vector which is parameterized by string, but that's just an implementation artifact. Notice how a vector has something called iterator. Does anybody know the fancy C++ terminology for what an iterator is in this context? What's the name for that? It's a trait. So this is something called a trait. Remember value type? If uh, some people came to office hours today, we were talking about value type. So for the map example we looked at last time, Go back over here, take a careful look. You can see that value type is something that's part of map. 
value type is also a trait. Every um, container has a number of these traits that are associated with it. Iterator, const iterator, value type, and so on. There's some other ones, too, that we'll talk about. And those are basically um, types or dependencies that each of these things has that are used for generic programming and, and other purposes. This particular case is not a generic programming case. It's just the canonical way that you access an iterator. Yes? There are different ways to characterize. So the question was, uh, what are they? There are different ways to characterize dependencies or associated types that a container is related to. So a container has a value type. The value type is a type def of whatever type T was used to parameterize the container, uh, or, or things related to that. Like if it's a, if it's a map, then it's going to be the uh, key and the data. In the case of iterator, it's another type, which is the iterator for that particular type. So it's a way of being able to name something in a canonical way. Every STL container has a trait called iterator. And so whenever you're going to write code, it doesn't matter whether it's a vector or a deck or a list or a map or a set or whatever. It always has a trait called iterator. Now, when you look at your programming assignment, if you take a look, for example, at the grad version of the programming assignment for number two, let's go do that. Let's see if I can find this. Um, if you were to take a look at the grad version of this thing, let me make it a little bigger so you can see it better. We'll fix it. Okay. So here's the grad version, and you can see it's got these four declarations of class array iterator and const array iterator. We'll worry about those later. And then down here, you can see that we have a type def of t, where t is the parameter, to value type, so that's a trait. And then down here, we have a type def. Type def is just a, a name for a type. Type def of array iterator to the trait iterator, and const array iterator to the trait const iterator. And without getting too, too far afield, if you were to look down later in the file, you would see the implementation of array iterator. And if you looked at the implementation of array iterator, you would see that it defines all the various operations that an iterator is expected to have, like operator dereference, both const and non-const, pre-increment, post-increment, um, and uh, you know, plus plus, and minus minus, and all those kinds of things. So those are just some of the traits that are, are defined here. We'll talk more about traits later. They, they are very important in STL. All we're using right now is to be able to declare an an iterator j of type iterator, which is associated with vector. And then we call a factory function, factory method, called begin. And this factory method is going to return an iterator to the beginning of the container, which in this case is a vector. And then we're going to walk through this thing one element at a time. While we haven't reached the end of the iterator, or end of the, uh, the, end of the iteration through the container, and until we reach that, we're going to dereference the iterator to print out the result. And then we're going to plus plus the iterator by 1 to advance it. Yeah? So is the plus plus operator overloaded for iterator to? Yes. The question is, is plus plus overloaded? The answer is yes. Uh, so for example, if we switch back over here, you would see that, uh, for example, here's plus plus for our array iterator, which is not. It's very similar to what Vector is doing, almost identical, in fact. OK, so lots of cool things. Um, let's go ahead and, just for kicks, let's go ahead and compile this code. And we'll take a quick look at it. By the way, some people asked me today what, um, what I'm using to edit. And it's Emacs, but I, I don't recommend you learn it unless you really are into old school stuff. If you still listen to vinyl records, then you can learn Emacs, right? <laughs> but if you're an MP3 player you know, person, don't, don't, uh, don't use Emacs. It's really cool, though. I'm super fast. I've been doing it since 1985, so it's like second nature. So, so here's the code. Let's see if it runs. It does. So there you go.
A um, couple things I want to show you about this thing, right? Just, just to make it kind of clear. First of all, first question, why do we do plus plus J instead of J plus plus? It's slower for implementation reasons. You will learn in your next assignment why it is slower. So things that you've taken on faith up to this point, you get now to learn from the School of Hard Knocks why it's slower. And you'll, you'll see it's, it's in, infinitesimally slower, but it's somewhat slower. So why, why make it slower than you need, need to? By the way, just for kicks, this code here is kind of mimicking this code. Uh, int array, and this is not going to be quite exactly the same, but it's going to be uh, along the same lines, you know, 0. One, two, three, four. You might say four int pointer IP equal array. IP not equal to array plus five plus plus IP. Standard C out IP standard endl. So this code here, while not identical, is similar in spirit to this code down here. So you can see it's kind of the same thing. We're going while we haven't reached the end. We're plussing, plussing each time. We start out with an iterator that begins at the start of the range we want to iterate over, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of equivalencies. And that's why all those algorithms like copy and fill all take iterators, because they don't know or care if they're working on built-in stuff or they're working on user-defined stuff. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. Daniel. So if you were doing this code, you could definitely, if you were writing this code down here, you could say IP less than. That would be fine. Um, that doesn't work quite the same with iterators, so it's better not to do this. Uh, by the way, uh, another little piece of trivia for you. If you're a C++ 11 programmer, you wouldn't never, so, so, so a, a, an STL programmer would write code like this if they were familiar with the traditional forms of, of uh, STL. A C++ 11 programmer would more likely write code that looked like this. They would say auto ref j. Um, projects so they would most likely replace the use of the handcrafted implementation of the iterator pattern as expressed through STL and its factories and its iterators and plus pluses and all that good stuff right that they they would take the handcrafted pattern realization which we show here and they would replace it with the version that takes the pattern and bakes it into the programming language compiler, which is now called a range-based for loop. Um, Java has a similar kind of thing, like a for each loop. So this basically says, I know that you are an STL container, and therefore I will auto-deduce what your type is, and I can use it right like this. This is a great example of something that's been happening in computing, much like we just talked about with respect to abstraction, for 50 years. Things that make themselves useful as patterns find their way into programming languages. And that's been going al along forever. We'll talk more about that when we get further into the patterns part of the class. But it's pretty cool. And it's exactly what you'd expect, right? People take stuff that they do by hand, and after they do it 500 times by hand, they go, I bet I could automate that. right? That's what separates us from lower forms of life. right? <laughs> we, we automate. In fact, um, Let's see, I'm trying to think where I could find this. Yeah. Oh, I know where I can find it. Yeah, this is silly, but it's funny. All right, so there we go. So this is basically the evolution of humanity, right? <laughs> Not entirely clear if it's going forward or backwards at some level, but that's, that's evolution nonetheless. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so let's talk in our remaining 15 minutes or so before the quiz, let's talk a bit about iterator categories, because they're important to understand. 
um, and you'll be exposed to them over and over again as you get further along into STL and generic programming. So there are five types of iterator categories. And very, very quickly, they are input and output iterator categories, forward iterator categories, bidirectional iterator categories, and random access iterator categories. And they build on each other. So if you were to draw it sort of as an inheritance hierarchy, um, input and output iterator categories are kind of the parents. Four iterators inherit from both. Bidirectional iterators inherit from four iterator. And in some sense, random access it, 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 in, iterators inherit from bidirectional iterators. Now, they actually don't inherit anything. It's just in terms of the, the conceptual inheritance of including all the methods that are defined in the previous categories in what they expose to people who use them. Do not think of them in C++ inheritance. Think of them in inheritance as we might think about conceptual inheritance. Right? They don't, it's not subclasses from. It has the features of your ancestor. You know, more like what we think about in everyday life. You, know, you inherit your parents' eye color or your parents' hair color or your parents' you know, hand shape or something like that. Yeah? Oh, back to the other example. Yeah. Good question. This is something, the question is, what is this? This is a new feature in C11 called type deduction. And it basically says, compiler, you keep track of details. I don't want to get carpal tunnel syndrome from having to write something that looks like this. Right? That's a lot of characters. The compiler knows, if, if the, compiler, the compiler knows that this is an STL type. And therefore, it can auto deduce what the loop variable should be. So it should be an iterator, right? So this is basically a reference to an iterator. And therefore, when we access this thing here, we'll get it as the value. So if you were to um, do auto um, reference j colon and then a regular array, would it be the same as for int i equals 0, i less than array dot i plus plus? <laughs> Great question. Let's see. Oops. Better. If I want this to work, I've got to give it the C11 flag. All right. Uh, hello, world. Just proving to you that it still works. OK, so your question was, I think, um, what if we had says it like this? Int a um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, that's, that's, our, that's our array. Then I could actually say, Tuck this up here. I could say for auto i a standard c out i standard end all. And lo and behold, it actually works, right? See, so yeah, never exactly, never, never write a traditional for loop again. This is so cool, right? Actually, why is this so cool? I thought arrays didn't keep track of their size. Ah, that's a very, very good observation or good question. Arrays in C and C++, you know, prior to C++11 didn't, but now they do. So the, the compiler, but, but it's only, it's only the, the type like that. It's, it's not like you can't, you can't do this. You can't say, um, you can't say new T. Five, you know, that that won't do that. But but the built-in arrays that are given initializer list will keep track of it. Yeah. Great, great questions. The question was, is there a downside of this? There there are two downsides. Number one, if you write clear code, you risk your job security. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> there's, no, there's no downside in that respect. The only downside is if you don't have a compiler that supports C11 or doesn't have this feature, it's not going to compile. So that, that's the main, backward compatibility is the main inhibitor to, to using this. But, but if you don't have that problem, then no, there's, there's really no. There, in fact, the compiler could probably generate better code because it knows more about the type information. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, sure, you could say something like this. 
um, if I equal to break else. So all the good, all the good looping stuff. Oops. We will come back and fix that later because we're running out of time. <laughs> but but yes, you you should be able to. Uh, you should be able to do that kind of stuff, and it'll work just like you would use anything else. OK. Other question? Yeah. <laughs> was the question, was this be, would this be considered a form of abstraction? Yeah, this would be considered a form of control abstraction. So we've looked at data abstraction. Classes are a great example of data abstraction. Um, functions are a great example of function abstraction. And then iterators and range-based for loops are a good example of control abstraction. You're teaching the compiler how to abstract away from the, the tedious and error-prone details of writing uh, the, the loop counter and keeping track of the loop ranges and stuff like that. That's why it's a win. You don't have to keep track of that low-level stuff. OK. So these different categories. The cool thing about this is that native types, i.e. pointers, can be used as iterators. And, and typically, the built-in types have the most powerful form of iterator, which is the random access iterator. So we're going to talk about these different forms of iterators. Actually, I take, take it back. We're, we're going to switch over and talk about the programming assignment first, because we have about uh, seven minutes left. Next time, on, on Monday of next week, we're going to go through these examples. We'll talk about input iterators, look at an example. Output iterators, look at an example. Forward iterators, look at an example. You know, bidirectional, random access, and so on. And by that point, you should have a pretty good idea what these things do. For those of you who want to get started in the programming assignment before then, Take a look at these links, which are also in your programming specification, for information about how to write iterators and what to do with iterators. What you will discover with iterators is that they are really easy to use. And they're actually not that hard to implement. They're just tedious to implement. And so you'll end up having to write lots of very small methods, each of which has like one or two lines of code. And you'll find out that post increment and post decrement have a little bit more code than pre-increment and pre-decrement. Yet again, another reason to pref prefer the pre-version versus the post-version. So that's, that's the thing you need to do is take a look at those things. OK. Let's go over and look at the, the assignment. What I want to do is, is kind of start with uh, let's go ahead and start with the AQ version of this stuff, because that's the one that's due first. All right, so you can see here, just like we did for the array implementation for the grad version before, I think I mentioned this before. In class, typically what we do is the, the grad students get the joy of trying something first, getting a little experience, and then a week or two later, the undergrads get to do something along those lines. So the grad students are a little bit ahead, which is fine, and then the undergrads get a chance to play around with it. We don't expect them to do it quite as fast, although many people do very well. So here is here are some of the four declarations for the different iterators. We'll see how those things get used. Here is AQ. As you can see, an AQ is a Q is a class that's defined with type uh, a type T for the type of Q, like a Q of int or a Q of employee record or a Q of double or whatnot. And it also takes as a second parameter that's an optional parameter the implementation that's used for it, which in this case is array of T, which is what you just got done implementing or what you're in the process of implementing is array of T. So this is why it's important to have a properly working array implementation so that your AQ will work properly. We define ourselves a trait, as you can see here, value type. We define a couple of exceptions, underflow and overflow. We define some constructors. Obviously, uh, so, you know, the constructor that takes size parameter is going to make a size. That's pretty clear, hopefully. Um, and uh, we have a copy constructor. That should be no surprise. Assignment operator, those things are all you know, very simple. What you're basically going to do is you're going to set a bunch of fields. And you're going to be using the fact that there's an array, your array, as the implementation under the hood. And you're going to pass the size that was given at the constructor into the constructor of your array in the base member initialization section. Now, there should be no need in the array queue implementation to allocate any memory dynamically. So if you find yourself saying new array, or you're changing the header file to make it a pointer, you're going down the wrong path. So it's just an object of type array. You give it a parameter in the base member initialization section. No must have fun. Quick question. Uh, should our tail be on or one task? Great question. So <clears throat> I recommend starting head and tail 
at the same location, zero. And then they'll grow as, as you go along. Um, there's lots of different ways to do this. In fact, before I say that, let me just go ahead and, and uh, make sure that that's actually what I did before I. I think that's what I did. Yes, I set head and tail equal to 0. And I pass in an extra value to the underlying array so it has a dummy node. And you'll see later what the dummy node is good for. So count starts out at 0. Head and tail start out at 0. Make the, the underlying array be 1 bigger to make a so-called dummy node. Destructor does nothing. It's just a no-op. OK. The interesting methods, NQ and DQ, obviously the purpose of an NQ method is to put something at the end of the queue. The purpose of the DQ method is to take something out of the front of the queue. That's how a classic queue works. That's how our queue is going to work. Fixed size queue uses a circular queue underneath. You'll see more about that later. Front returns the top item um, without removing it. DQ removes the, the front item without um, returning it. Is empty and is full. Check to see if the queue is empty or full. We have some uh, size that returns the number of elements in the queue. Uh, I will give you that as a hint. Oops. Just return the count. <laughs> so don't get too fancy. It just returns the current number of elements in the queue. The count of the queue, not the size of the queue, the count of the number of elements. Equal and not equal, those are going to get implemented under the hood using the STL equal method. Swap, we'll do your normal swap, dealy. Here are the type defs that we have to type def the traits. And then here are the iterators that we use to get iterators to the beginning and end of the queue. Yeah? Uh, it simplifies the implementation even more. So. It, at, at the cost of one extra element, there's like no special ch special checks or any special cases, which is kind of cool. So the only methods here that even require any significant thought or method <laughs> is increment. If you're implementing the grad version, there's a decrement. That takes a little bit more thought. The purpose of increment is to return the next element that's one past what you pass in. So if you increment something, you pass in the current thing you want to increment, and it gives you the next one. Now, why do we abstract incrementation? Okay, Jeff. What's the reason we, we have a method called increment? Because it's, because it's circular in this case. Because it's circular. And what that means is when it reaches the end, like let's say we have 10 elements. When it gets to the 10 elements, obviously it can't keep inserting past the 10th element, right? Or it'll be overwriting and scrambling memory in some random way. So what it's going to do, it's going to wrap back around again and go back to the beginning. Now, it'll only do this if there's room, of course. And so head and tail just kind of follow each other in the queue, and then they loop back around again. So an increment is an abstraction that your NQ and DQ methods are going to do in order to set head and tail to the next value based on what just happened, whether you NQ or DQ. So that's where you have to do a little bit of thinking. It turns out it's ridiculously simple, but once you're done, you'll find your program is very, very, very simple. And as often the case in this class, the design is what is tricky. The implementation is really simple. And that's what you find over and over again. If you think about the design, the code is much uh, more straightforward. Yes, Daniel? Why is the increment method abstracted as opposed to private or public? Um, just because we're not entirely sure who might need it. We don't really need to expose it to the outside world, but a subclass might need it, so we just hedged our bets and made it protected. We could argue, you know, that, that could be debated and people could decide if that was good or not. Okay. Any questions?